Welcome back to the final session of this two-day workshop on uh, transmediality and uh, so storytelling. Uh, I would quickly start this session today. Thank you everyone for joining us. It is an absolute honor to introduce Professor Rashmi Doraswamy once again on this platform. She's a professor of Acad Academy of International Studies, Jamia Media Islamia, New Delhi. She has authored, edited, and co-authored numerous books, some of them being perspectives on multiculturalism, pre-Soviet, Soviet, Soviet and post-Soviet Central Asia, which was published in 2013, Guru Dutt, Through the Light and Shade, 2008, Cultural Histories of Central Asia, 2009, Being and Becoming, The Cinemas of, A of Asia, 2002, and many more. She has participated in national and international seminars and has served on many statutory and non statutory film festivals and critic juries in uh, India as well as abroad. She was the recipient of the National Award for the Best Film Critic in 1994. She was honorary deputy director of the Academy of Third World Studies from October 2005 to May 2007. She was also the officiating director of the Academy of International Studies from August 2015 to July 2020. Professor Doraswamy has for several years been associated with the Department of Modern Indian Languages and Literary Studies, University of Delhi, where she has performed as the, in the role of the advisor to uh, PhD students and evaluated PhD thesis as well. She is also on the advisory board of the Delhi Journal of Comparative Studies. It is an absolute honor to have you with us, ma'am, once again today. And you left us with some valuable insights and food for thought from your talk uh, yesterday. Thank you for agreeing to chair this session, ma'am. Professor Durasamy is going to be the chair for this session. And we have two speakers. We have two papers today. I will quickly give the titles. First uh, title, uh, I mean, the first paper that we have today, the first presentation is Media. The narrator of folklore and oral literature to be presented by Sultim Sangmo from the University of Delhi. The second presentation that we have uh, is titled Analyzing the Meanings of the Ethics and Migration and in Nirifur Demir's photograph photography by Fatima from Jawaharlal Nehru University and Zara from uh, Islamic Azad University, Central, uh, Central Branch, Tehran. Uh, each of the speakers will have uh, 15 minutes each to present their uh, presentations, present their papers, which will be followed by a roundtable discussion on these two papers, as well as a generic, uh, an overall discussion of the two days of the workshop. So I would like to invite the first presenter now. Tim, can you hear me? I... Yeah, I see her. So, Tim, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay. So, uh, you, you can start now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, give, me now, give me a minute. Sure. We cannot hear you. You just unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so yeah, first of all, I would like to thanks to the organizer uh, for giving me this opportunity to represent my paper on uh, media or intermediality. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the topic that I have chosen uh, for uh, to, uh, to represent is uh, media, the narrator of folklore and oral literatures with reference to uh, Ladakh uh, literature. So yeah, um, uh, like uh, any other states, uh, Ladakh has rich in oral literature, representing their roots, cultural practice, and everyday life. In fact, uh, the oral songs and dance is used to be the leading source of entertainment besides narrating the history and eco-culture relation. Uh, there are multiple oral songs and folklore uh, that had been transmitted from generations and this noble act of transmission is uh, gradually vanished. In fact, Ladakh culture and oral literature is embedded with ecosystem as um, it is nicely depicted by Helen Norbeck uh, in her text, uh, but the interlace between the two is uh, disturbed by the modernization. Uh, earlier, there was uh, no written uh, form of literature. The language they use is spoken only. Uh, though they have the script originated from Tibet, but it is not successful to give the uh, spoken language a written form. Therefore, folklore and folk song is one of the medium to narrate the historical culture of uh, Ladakh. And until the introductions of modern education system and modernization, uh, there was a smooth flow of oral literature in Ladakh. There was ample time and space between the narrator and the listener of oral literature. Uh, but the establishment of uh, modern education system as well as the modernization has affected uh, many of Ladakh's cultural practices, uh, which also include oral literature. Uh, uh, one of the uh, traveler, and uh, she in her uh, books, uh, her name is Ransby, she uh, remarks about the changes that comes in Ladakh's culture. And uh, yeah, uh, and the culture that he depicted in that very text, it could be assumed also as oral literature because culture means everyday life, uh, yeah, according to Raman Valium. And people of Ladakh, prior to modernization, have performed many seasonal ceremonies in which uh, folk song and dance was a must. The removal of uh, such seasonal ceremonies and festival, which was affected by the modernizations, um, minimized the practices and transmissions of oral literatures and with the passage of time the oral songs remain unsung and gradually disappear. Uh, the coming of a modern education system and modernization has established a new space between grandparents and child uh, who are the two important figure of preserving, narrating and transmitting the oral literature. Uh, the influence of modernization is noticed before the establishment of modern education system Modern educations on the one hand affect the people and they start creating a city thereby shifted the space of learning folk song and on the other hand the modern education is percolated in every village and succeeded to replace this culture of oral transmitted uh, literature. In this situation, in this uh, such situations, the media comes up as an intermediality between the writer singer on the one hand and oral literatures on the other hand to preserve to pass these oral literatures to the generations to come and many scholar and singer on experiencing the in dangers to the oral literature of Ladakh they with the help of media especially the radio the photograph the television and text itself are succeeded to collect most of the oral literature of Ladakh uh, and yeah, therefore, I must say that it is important in this sense to unfold how the media comes as an uh, only alternative to fill the void and that act as a narrator, a transmitter and preserver of oral literature. And uh, yeah, and I'm going to discuss uh, the space shared by photograph, uh, radio, uh, takes and televisions with the 
oral literature and how they have a, a pivotal role as narrator of uh, roots culture and as a, um, a, a transmitter as well. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, I uh, want to discuss the in, uh, multimediality and the uh, folk culture and the interlace between the two uh, over the period of time. Uh, uh, printing press and text is the earliest form of media that introduced by the Western writers who came to Ladakh as a traveler. And in the text history of Western Ladakh, uh, A.F. Franke mentioned the number of writers who are considered as a Western uh, first writer of Ladakh. Uh, these writers are the one who use text to depict the history of the Ladakh the textual analysis of their texts demonstrate the visual understanding of the ancient culture and history. And the analysis of many historical texts is evidence that uh, prior to this Western writer, the writing, uh, writing style or writing form exists in Ladakh uh, during the uh, fourth century. But such texts are wholly religious and rarely used by the Buddhist missionaries. The findings of many religious texts and the missionaries that travel from Kashmir to Tibet while Ladakh in between 14 to 10th century reveals the existing of writing before the Western travelers. However, however, the detailed investigation is not needed to be done. How the apparatus of writing has been evolved over a period of time. Uh, according to hearsay, it is believed that the early religious texts were written on the leaves and on ropes, and uh, gradually with the coming of printing press, the religious text comes in paper form of writing. And the oral uh, literatures during this period, that is from 10th century to 18th century, is hold a good positions because the effect of modernization has not yet been realize people of Ladakh during this period spent most of their time on farm and oral literature has a close associations with farming. Since their ecoculture is unaffected by the modernizations, the whole region of Ladakh is depend of farming. There were cities, but the people uh, there also do farming in which a uh, folk song must be sung while plowing and harvesting. Beside these, uh, there were ceremonies that were held to celebrate parents to plowing and harvest. These ceremonies is crucial in the sense that it provides the space to folk to be sung and the whole people, irrespective of caste, gender, and age, is participate in folk songs and dance. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, I think you have two minutes, top three. Okay, so yeah, so uh, uh, other than printing and text, we have also picture, and in uh, in fact, in the text written by uh, uh, our Ladakhi writer Ngawang Shakspo, uh, entitled "Cultural History of Ladakh Through Folk Songs and Dance," mentions about the variety of uh, folk songs that have been associated with farming. And the song, the song, the folk song that uh, used to be sung during plowing, the folk song that used to be sung during harvesting, and there, there, there is also a marriage song, religious song. Yeah, all this song somehow associated with the festival, and these and the celebrations of this festival somehow provide the space for the oral literature to be transmitted. But with the effect of modernizations. Um, the coming of modernizations evolved the shared space of the people of Ladakh with the ecoculture, result affecting also the oral culture. And yeah, and uh, um, uh, Rashmi Ma'am in her article says uh, that modernization comes in the form of capitalisms, industrializations, and such effect also do notice here in Ladakh and thereby shifted the ge geo demography, creating new cities in which the space of oral culture has nothing to do. In fact, in cities, the farming lands once enjoyed the song of the roots is now converted into buildings that could only hear the exchange of money. 
and it only takes two centuries to replace the oral cultures with modernizations. The photographer, along with the oral songs, narrates the change that comes in the cultural practice. Uh, what is capable of, uh, but what is capable of ritual in the oral song is narrated by the photograph. The photograph works as an intermediality that it's narrated the accurate story of modernizations over the primitive culture. Photograph, in fact, is the eyewitness of evolving culture. What was then is not now. In fact, the photograph is an intermediality, authenticate the culture narrated by the folk song. It as an apparatus of media that tells stories of the past to the coming generations. The picture taken by historians A.F. Franke and writers and director uh, Stanzin uh, depicted the evolving folk cultural practices in Ladakh. Whenever the text fails to give an accurate visualizations of the past culture, the picture comes as a way to narrate it vividly. Many travelers in Ladakh in 19 or 18 centuries capture a lot of picture which narrate the evolving geodemography of the regions. Um, beside the photograph, travelers in the form of texts and videos have emergence as a new form of media. The making of media in Ladakh is developed around the introductions of All India Radio in 19th century. The video strengthened the capture of changing geodemography of the region. The cinematic features have to turn the photography and record folk songs into a documentary movie, and such contribution is made by Helen Norbeck also, who not only published the text about the coexistence relations between oral songs and ecosystems, but also interestingly succeed to display it in the form of a movie. She, with many writers, established the intermediality of photograph, oral song, and eco-fragile culture of Ladakh. And uh, one of the directors, standing from Gya, who effectively produced the documentary movie on the shepherd of Ladakh. This movie is not only the representations of his sister's life as a shepherd, but also the st story of sustainable and balanced ecosystem in the region. Like his sister, most people in village were shepherd. However, the coming of industrializations and capitalisms also impact the riding of sheep and goats. The shepherd has been interlaced with the oral songs. When the shepherd lingering over the multi mountain along with the sheep and goats, she had the ample time to celebrate herself and oral song is one of the source. Today, beside the nomadic life in Changtang, hardly few vill villages had the custom of rearing the sheep and goat. And with the destruction of this culture, the oral literature itself ceased to be calculated. Instead of the interference of modernization in the space of oral culture of Ladakh, the oral literature is still able to exist and affected by the modernizations. And this has been made possible by the introductions of All India Radio, where the employees made an extensive effort to collect and record all the possible folk songs. The prominent singer, a receiver of Padma Shri Award, Murup Namgyal, has a great contributions in the record of most of the folk songs, uh, which uh, what Frankie expressed folk song in the form of text is explicitly sung by Nguruk Nangyal in the form of, uh, yeah, which comes in the form of uh, videos. Uh, so yeah, then uh, other than modernization, the biggest challenge to the oral literatures is the introductions of uh, modern education systems. On analyzing the historical text, it comes to know that there was no formal education system in Ladakh and in many travelogues, it is demonstrated that most of the people of Ladakh had spent life on agriculture and rearing cattle. While the youth of the family work on the field, the grandparents were sitting in home with the infant telling them the folklore and folk songs. In fact, they used to have an ample time and relations and space between the grandparents and grandchildren of the family. And it is in this space that the grandchildren learn folklore and traditional songs. However, the introductions of modern education disturb the space and gradually eradicate the shared relation of grandparents and grandchild and shift the paradigm of oral literature's transmission. 
Uh, and the sad part is that along with the modern educations, the government failed to create an environment where the oral literature could also coexist. So yeah, overall, I must say that if the media is not established in time, the modern education system and modernization could have been successful over the eradications of folk culture here in Ladakh. And indeed the media comes as in modality to represent the narrative of oral culture and also help in narrating the historical and fragile eco-culture of Ladakh. Though the modern Neti replaced the short space of folk learner culture, media is successful in constructing its own space of telling oral literature to the generations to come. Yeah, that's that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for a very insightful uh, presentation on uh, the evolving cultures of Ladakh and placing the pictures in the, you know, of, as, as narratives yeah. in this shift. Thank you so much. Um, we would, I'm sure there would be lots of questions. Yeah, uh, uh, we would like to move to our uh, second presentation of the day. Um, so we have uh, Fatima and uh, Zahra, can you hear me? Hello, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, it's good evening here, hello. Yeah, so uh, I will just introduce the title of our paper first and then Zahra will show some of the photos and also add some description. So we are presenting uh, a paper titled Analyzing the Meanings of Ethics and Migration uh, in the Photography of Nilofar Demir. So, yeah, sorry to show these disturbing photos, but um, these are some of the pictures the photographer has uh, captured. And Zahra, now, could you please add? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, uh, hello. Um, in many uh, countries of the Middle East, thousands of people have been uh, displaced in recent years due to war, civil war, or ISIS and uh, violence in their home countries. Uh, when war and conflict are uh, inevitable, uh, it creates mayhem in the country. That is why there has been an influx of uh, immigrants and refugees entering Europe in uh, recent years. And uh, some of the immigrants are labeled as illegal and governments try hard to curb illegal influx of refugees and immigrants. And uh, Turkish journalist Nilufer Demir's photo of Alan Kordi in 2050 was the forefront of news. And uh, the onus of ethics lies on conscious of masses who have over time elected uh, leaders uh, who have uh, waged a war against humanity. Moreover, Dina Nayari's uh, book, The Ungrateful Refugees, that published in uh, 2019, uh, which gives a detailed accounts of refugees, mainly from Iran, Iran uh, trying to flee Iran post-revolution. Uh, and uh, both Dina Nayari's book and uh, Nilofar Demir's photo um, draw attention to children as a victim of war and life of refugees. And uh, Nayari charts out the details of uh, the life of refugees uh, through her own experiences and through reporting and field trips. And uh, she describes the constant hum uh, humiliation of refugees and the humiliation of constantly waiting, uh, waiting for life to begin as the citizens of some country and waiting for dignity uh, to come by. And uh, there are five pictures of uh, Alan Kordi that uh, there are two pictures that belongs to the time when he was alive. And uh, in one of the pictures, he uh, hides a teddy bear. And in, in another one, he is a playground. Uh, Alan uh, doesn't know anything about the world around himself. He doesn't know uh, his nationality, religion, war, East or West, and uh, yet he becomes a victim of hate uh, politics that uh, creates uh, war and despises refugees. And last photos, um, 
that uh, shows Alan uh, in the arm of a uh, rescuer from the humanitarian organization Sea Watch that uh, this photo is a symbol of kindness and guilt that cannot be uh, quantified. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Zara. So I will add, add this to, to the presentation. Yeah. Uh, Demir is a Turkish photographer and the circumstances in which she captured this photo happens to be like this. Um, she was crossing a beach in Bodrum in Turkey when she happened to see a small boy in red t-shirt, blue pants and black shoes and his face down in the sand. So um, she's like we said, she's a photojournalist. So she works for this news agency called Dogan News Agency. And at the time when this scene, uh, when she happened to cross the scene, the only thought that came into her mind was to take a picture of this scene. Of course, the photo went viral on social media and on news outlets. Uh, and later it was confirmed that the boy, the small boy, Alan, and his family were crossing the Aegean Sea to Greece, uh, uh, in which 12, the boat, in that boat, 12 people had died when their boat capsized. There were no life vests, no other security or any other precautions that were being taken. And out of the entire family, only the father, uh, sir, uh, survived. Yeah. So there is a reason why I'm giving this description because we are also discussing um, the ethics of representation. Uh, it is common knowledge that most journalists, photo journalists, or anyone, there are certain rules that people need to follow while representing certain things, um, certain kind of news or pictures. Uh, according to one one writer, Danny Elliott, who teaches at University of Florida, uh, there has to be a balance between uh, freedom of expression and uh, ethics, how much people can show, how much people can um, tell to the whole world. Uh, this is, of course, right, but uh, sometimes these paradigms are not right when we are dealing with um, special circumstances and, and the circumstances of refugees are indeed very special because they are not like um, other refugee, uh, uh, sorry, other citizens or economic migrants. Uh, so that is what we are discussing here. So taking this um, um, observation or this argument that there has to be a balance between freedom of the speech and uh, and uh, representation. I would like to add that uh, there is a certain way in which refugees are portrayed. And in fact, there is enough research on this that refugees are depicted in a certain way, uh, often on boats, not as individuals, in groups. So all this, which seems so commonplace to us, com us, to many of us is actually dehumanizing them uh, without even knowing that we are dehumanizing them, showing them as um, just statistics crossing the sea or crossing this border or that border. And according to one research, sometimes they also show Christian motives, religious motives to depict how they are moving from one place to another place for survival, um, many kind of representations, of course. So first attempt to um, bring justice to this kind of uh, representation. I mean, how to avoid it and how to justify the way they are immigrating is to reject all existing paradigms for, for refugees. Uh, because migration is of course a natural phenomena and uh, people immigrate for different reasons, for work, for better prospects. We have a whole body of literature that, that deals with it. But when we are talking about refugees, we need different paradigms to analyze not just the ethics of migration. Like I said, no West, no security, nothing, not just the ethics of migration, but also the ethics of how much we can consume, the ethics of consumerism. Um, Demir, the photographer, what she has shown is, of course, a matter of ethics. We can question that. but 
it also lies on the common masses, people like us or everyone else that why are these situations being created in the first place and uh, how should we create a world in which we don't have to consume this kind of um, representation. So we are shifting those paradigms and challenging the existing paradigms here. Uh, and of course, like Zahra mentioned, Dina Nairi's work, The Ungrateful Refugee, where she combines reporter and um, her own memories as a refugee, uh, and, and she clearly demarcates between economic migrants and refugees, and she says that, I quote her here, unlike economic migrants, refugees have no agency and they are no threat. This is very interesting because uh, when we uh, uh, when we see news or research where people say that close border, one of the reasons why we need close border is security, which sounds valid, but uh, but that is a very sloppy side to refuse refugees into one's country because there are no threat. They have no agency. They are absolute non-entity in the bigger picture of a nation state. And in fact, in the same book, she goes on to say that the only constant thing that is um, the only constant thing for refugees is perpetual waiting. They are waiting for getting their papers, getting, I mean, so many people are interviewing them, so many people are asking valid reasons, and it's like, it's like they are justifying why they are alive and how they made it to this country. So uh, even though they are camps and people, aids and government aids and all those sort of things, she says that, the humiliation of waiting is only known to refugees, not to anyone else. So, because their whole life depends on that. The first, they are waiting, and in case they are, um, their request for asylum, asylum seeking is accepted. Only then they have a, they have this assurance that they will start living like a dignified citizen. Otherwise, it's just waiting, waiting, and sometimes for a very long time. And Nairi has herself said in one of her uh, books in, in her fiction work that uh, she, was in, she wrote about that book after one asylum seeker committed suicide. After years of waiting, 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 the person felt so dejected that he committed suicide. So. These are the things. So going back to the physical description of the picture, like I said, red t-shirt and all that, if we consider that picture as a text, let's consider that as a text. Uh, even if we uh, anal uh, see the, analyze the form, the what is being shown to us, that also asks many questions about how we um, approach certain, um, you know, situations and what kind of ideologies we believe in and how we justify them. Uh, according to one research, one article by this researcher, Jacob Scholweg, and of course, at J Jacob Scholweg et al., others are also involved. Uh, this is very interesting. The effect of the picture, according to their study, they did a long study after the um, what you call after the picture went viral uh, and they say that there was so much outpouring of my god this picture that, that picture on twitter on facebook uh, they analyzed they observed that the effect of the picture subsided too fast it's like suddenly there is so much outpouring of emotion and then nothing when people were asked to review their own um, review their own opinions about refugees, about borders, and about what they believe in, what kind of leaders they are electing, uh, and situations like this are arising. So uh, according to them, people went back to their old beliefs way too fast. I mean, yes, they were sympathetic and empath sympathetic at the beginning, but they went back to their old beliefs too fast, and they forgot all about it. So, which is very interesting, which I call uh, as uh, I have given a term to this kind of impulsive outpouring, what I would 
call that you see the picture and you suddenly behave in a certain way but then uh, over a period of time when you are asked to review your own opinions about certain things about policy about policy makers about laws refugee laws then you go back to your old beliefs so um, which sorry is to interrupt uh, uh, we are running short of time please okay just two minutes just two i will just yeah. wrap up sure. yeah. two minutes so yeah, uh, apart from that, what I would like to say, because we are running short of time. Yes, now uh, mediator here is of course, the social media, consumerism, capitalism, all of that. But I will leave all of you with one question that oral literature or oral tales are integral to any culture, whether in India or Australia, America, the indigenous populations, they have um preserved oral tales and that's how they evolve and you know remember their past what kind of past are we giving to these refugees the past of trauma they have no tales to remember the only tales uh, they remember is traumatic traumatic passage and that too if it happens and then constant waiting so compared to the uh, to the old age belief that uh, oral tales are passed as a way of memory. And oral tales are especially important for people who migrate to some other place because that's how they remember the memories, they keep the memories of the place they have left. So not only we have to question the paradigms of uh, representation of ethics and migration, but also storytelling for refugees. So yeah, I will leave it here. Of course, there is a lot to say, but I will leave it here. If you have any questions, we can definitely take them up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Fatna. Uh, I would request uh, Professor Duraswamy for uh, her comments on the two presenters, and then we can take up the questions if there are any. Over to you, ma'am. OK. Uh, we can start, uh, Rashmi ma'am has requested to start with the question and answers round for the two presenters uh, while she tries to log back in. Uh, she's trying to work this technical issue out. So I open the floor for questions for the two papers that we have had. Do we have any questions or comments? Uh, Aru, if I may, um, yes. I have... Uh... Uh, Rashmi ma'am on the phone right now. She okay. says if she can just give her comments via my audio. Is that okay? Yeah, we can try that. But that will be very feeble. In the morning, we noticed that Nirja's audios were not audible. So either uh, uh, something should be worked out. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened I, because my uh, everything works okay normally. I don't know. I'll just figure it. I just wanted to say, can I speak now? Sorry. Ye yes, ma'am. Nilza, if you can just communicate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yes. yeah good evening. I'm really sorry uh, for this uh, mess up. I don't know what happened. Uh, but both my computer and my phone, uh, when I put on the Zoom, I, I'm not audible. I'm very sorry about this. Uh, I just wanted to say that these two presentations were extremely interesting for two reasons. I mean, for several reasons, actually. One is that both of them uh, had kind of uh, opposite points of view, in a sense. Uh, the first one by... Uh, Sutlim Zagmo, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, Sutlim, um, spoke of how modernization had uh, intervened in, uh, in, in, in the lives of a basically nomadic agricultural community. And uh, the thing that she said really touched me was that earlier, uh, they had ample time. And, uh, you know, there's this thing of ample time that grandparents could sit with grandchildren and pass on the oral uh, culture. And that was no longer possible because of the way time has kind of shrunk. And, uh, you know, with, with the farming getting less and the eco-culture getting uh, all changed. So, and, and then uh, the role of uh, on India radio. Uh, I think it's a very interesting thing that here is a, 
a state set up um, media, uh, the radio, and that is uh, playing a very positive role. It's playing the role of uh, narrator, archiver, uh, documenter, um, and, uh, you know, of folk culture, folk music, folk songs, everything. So uh, I think this uh, was a very, very important part of um, her wonderful presentation on Ladakh. Uh, the second presentation by uh, Fatma and Zahra, again, a, a very different kind of uh, uh, theme, uh, which is dealing with the social media. Uh, and um, as uh, Fatima said, the impulsive outpouring uh, on Alan Kurdi's uh, photo, which, which went viral, uh, the tragedy of that little child who, as uh, she pointed out, didn't have any identity, uh, didn't know what identity means. He was too young to even know what uh, you know was happening around him, who he was, which country he belonged to. And yet he became a victim of uh, identity politics in a sense, you know, of, of the bigger politics of conflict, war, what Zahra mentioned in the beginning, that war, conflict, uh, civil war, violence, ISIS, I mean, terrorism, so many things which are displacing people. Uh, the second point that was extremely important is the difference between political refugees and other kinds of refugees and this whole thing of perpetual waiting. I think both the papers really brought out uh, a sense of time, you know, that you are waiting, the humiliation of waiting and not knowing what is ever going to come of that wait. So uh, the tragedy of, say, the what was called the Iron Curtain, you know, the Iron Curtain fell, but then Fortress Europe took over. And the fact that people are not able to migrate, given the terrible circumstances, political circumstances in their own homes uh, to other countries and the kind of tragedy. And I think the other very uh, poignant thing about this paper was um, the fact of children, you know, that children are suffering. It's a, whether it is Alan Kurdi or uh, the refugees that um, uh, Nairi is speaking about, the focus is on children. So I think these are extremely uh, interesting uh, presentations and um, please go ahead with the question answers. I'll try and join. I'm really sorry about this. I really apologize very hard. I mean, my heartfelt apologies for this. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I we really hope that you are able to connect back as soon yeah. as possible. Thank you so yeah, much, yeah. Mike. I'm trying, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so uh, I would now like to open this session for a roundtable discussion. Uh, I, would, I would invite Professor Satyanath, uh, Professor Balaji, and uh, Amitabh, sir. We can have, the floor is open for discussion. No, I have a suggestion. Yes. Without a uh, a moderator or a chair sitting there, it's extremely difficult to steer a round table. So mm -hmm. I suggest you ask, request Balaji to be there. And if Rashmi joins, then we will have two chairs. Okay. Um, so that the, the discussion and, uh, and the direction of the discussion has to be somehow steered and monitored by somebody or other. Uh, uh, it cannot uh, proceed without uh, someone uh, monitoring it and uh, directing it in, in an appropriate direction. Sure, sir. Um, Balaji, sir, if you can hear us, I would like to request you to chair this discussion, the roundtable session. Sure, not a problem much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, when Rashmi ma'am is able to join us, that would be really no nice. No problem, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. So it's over to you now, sir, the session. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's been a very fruitful day uh, with a wide range of papers and some very interesting uh, ideas uh, that are popping out. We're about to begin the roundtable proceedings. This is basically to take a retrospective look on what has happened in the last two days and somewhere plot out the future directions uh, in terms of intermediality. So what, what are the questions that actually came up and 
how do we address them in terms of methodologies and in terms of an epistemic understanding of uh, how this this nature of transmission happens and occurs yes uh, may i request professor satyanath uh, to begin the proceedings uh, with his observations of samitha also then we can all contribute it no let someone talk and if you are very keen that i sh should start let me just start it and leave it i think you know there should be an open ended uh, uh, discussion rather than you know one of us trying to um, fix the frame before we start the discussion i believe you know uh, transmediality um, when we when we thought of this workshop or when the organizers thought of this workshop uh, there was something in front of us so we we i think you know we brought the issue of uh, transmediality in the indian sense so you know we had uh, uh, when we i mean transmediality you know uh, yesterday i spoke about it you know it has a very wide range you know and uh, several connections but i think you know when when the organizers thought of this workshop they thought of it as a sort of thinking the indian way of looking at transmediality or the indian material so this is where you know i think one of the questions that was raised in the afternoon is very pertinent is there a medieval transmediality um and and we, we don't and, and how are we going going to address the issues of transmediality with reference to the conventional politics of india that we talk of um is there a, is there a practice and is the theory embedded in the practice itself as many of our representational systems are these are some of the questions that uh, uh, we need to start with um and secondly you know i think you know let me uh, as not many people who participated in the that one of the things was to see that the entire team of uh, some uh, uh, six plus uh, two eight plus another three plus another chairperson they all sit and listen to it and take part in the discussion this panel was basically intended to that with to, to with that intention that hasn't happened uh, so that i think you know this is also the i mean i'm talking of the now nitty gritties that we need to before getting into i think you know as uh, workshop organizers our team has to realize that you know there these things must fairly be clearly mentioned in the workshop or the seminar format that the presence is highly useful not that it's making someone sit here and listen to it appears in many cases people just presented and quit this is the usual seminar culture format that we have but i think you know as as a student of this department i was i have been trying to sit and listen to any talk whether i am an expert in that area or not you know that is as members of dc delhi comparatives this is something that we were trying to carry it to the next uh, um, you know generation of scholars and that has as that has not happened that is something that we need to and also the, again the as far as the format is uh, is concerned i have another comment there is a difference between a seminar format and a and a, a workshop format a workshop is a workshop where you know i eventually something something you craft and show uh, or demonstrate uh, that means it's more aimed aim towards a method a methodology rather than a theory um see if you if i'm 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 critical but you know don't uh, feel bad you know this this i i do this always to my students so if outsiders are sitting here you know i'm not familiar with the, this uh, paradigm uh, please don't feel bad but i this, this is not with a, uh, anything uh, uh, negative uh, it it is only to provide a constructive uh, you know dimension to the discussion um 
I think you know most of the, some of the papers at least they talked about theory, 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 history, history, history. And by the time, see this. I mean, I, let me be very open. We thought of a twenty-minute time for each paper when the when the organizer proposed it. I said no, make it thirty minutes. What should, what will one provide in twenty in twenty minutes? Ten five minutes they take introduction, five minutes theory. At least ten minutes to, to for a discussion is too less. But it appears any amount of time that you give. You spend the first 25 or 30 minutes. You know, sometimes some of them even spilled over to the 30th minute range, only to talk about definitions, definitions. You see, as a workshop, um, Nilja, this is something which we need to. I mean, I have learned it the hard way, sitting two days, you know, for eight hours uh, at a stretch. The workshop model is probably different. We didn't understand that when we we, we thought everyone will follow this. Um, and secondly i think you know the whole the 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 whole exercise was to see how 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 are we going to read these things the, that material never came you know either at the most uh, a single picture come you know look at the way how katani and uh, rashmi used the visual material to explain that find spaces to understand that thereby develop a methodology to understand the visuality that We were, we are all of us are intermediality that we were all uh, trying to sell. I also felt towards the end of it, we did not talk about music. That's one dimension which must have come somewhere. That's you know in in the Indian system, the discussion is always three: the the text, the the acting or the gesture, and the music. You know, it's not only Bharata. But even in Talkapiyam, there is something called Muttamil, a discussion, three phases of Tamil, three dimensions of Tamil. So I think that being so closely interwoven, and as uh, someone who has read a bit of a history of music in India, in the sense history of musical texts in India, for some other exercise, I think the production of literature in medieval India and the production of Text on dance and music goes hand in hand, and and their products also come in handy. So I think these are some of the ideas that I uh, uh, that I thought of when listening to these papers. The papers were good; they are worked uh, extremely well, and uh, they are uh, interestingly woven. I mean, there is no doubt about it. But uh, as the seminar or uh, the workshop organizers had a frame and certain set of agendas. Uh, here afterwards, we should actually try our level best to uh, weave it in such a way, uh, rather uh, uh, you know communicate ourselves in such a way that we will at least be able to tell what exactly do we expect from that. That has to be bit, uh, become a bit more clear. I'll stop here. These these are the beginning comments. But you know if there is a need, oh now it's happy to see <laughs> Rashmi is back. Rashmi, what we have done is. in between we have uh, I, i mean i think charu should do it um, we have now two people to steer this session and i i, I will uh, stop here uh, uh, charu just please explain the format uh, now to rashmi so that you know both of them will... sure sir thank you i, I think i'll advocate for this for the dorai swami <laughs> please yes, sir, yeah, yeah i'll just you. Uh, Uh, ma'am you are i think you are on mute still so we are not uh, try unmuting yeah can you hear me now absolutely yes oh, oh. thank god and this is my husband's <laughs> computer i've just borrowed it so okay so it's good to have you back and uh, while you were away uh, satyana sir had suggested that we should have uh, two uh, people to chair these uh, the, the round table session so we have uh, Professor Balaji uh, with us. Um, so I think uh, he was filling in for you, and now we are uh, having a discussion. Satyana sir has given his uh, remarks. Um, we can, uh, uh, sir uh, Balaji sir. Uh, I I, can, I, uh, I agree with Balaji. Balaji, what he suggested just now yes, that uh, let us uh, yeah. chair the session okay. and let us discuss. After Satyana's comments, I think. Uh, do you think it would be uh if we 
keep it open for certain minutes. Any other participant apart from me, Satyanath or Balaji, if they want to add anything, not about their paper, but we are now talking what is the takeaway from this workshop, methodologically. Uh, so if we can have, if anyone wants to add anything, I mean, if Roshni agrees with that, I think that would yes, be... Yes, of course. In fact, I want to say something a bit. Sure. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, add, I mean, I want to, uh, what shall I say, um, supplement by contrast, in a sense, to uh, what Professor Satyanath said just now. Um, I wouldn't uh, be too um, critical of these two days. I think these two days have been extremely um, productive, um, even in terms of learning. I mean, of course, the content of the papers were very rich. Uh, the content of today's papers were very rich. I sat through the whole day. And um, despite the problems of structuration, structuration of paper, maybe that could be solved next time for the workshop by actually in your invitation letter, I'm sure you send out a concept note or something, some whatever that initial letter that goes from you to the participants, you can actually suggest a structure and say, you know, we give you 30 minutes and introduction should be, I mean, could be this much and so on and so forth. So that people know, I mean, after all, these are young people, uh, the workshop is for youngsters. And it is so that, uh, you know, the, everything is a learning experience. I learned so much in these two days that, I mean, given my age, I still am learning. So uh, I think that there has been a lot that has been positive. Uh, yesterday, we began with Professor Satyanath and the entire theoretical framework of um, the, the workshop with phonocentric and uh, it's come, okay, sorry. Okay, my, my... no, my then this is not working. Just give it back. So, uh, the, I think that what we saw, uh, what Satyana gave was um, well, if I may, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, maybe you can move the two devices away so that there is an echo. Yeah, they, they are placed too close to each other. Uh, and if you can unmute your device, your husband's device. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. I hope there's no echo. I am so sorry. This no echo. Has been such a mess. I think uh, Professor Satyanath began with a theoretical framework. Uh, and I think these um, concepts that he proposed of phonocentric, body centric, and scriptocentric uh, are extremely important for this whole discussion on intermediality. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Professor uh, Nadia. Uh, Tony's uh, presentation, which went deep into one particular poet and the whole question of uh, how, um, you know, the intermediality with painting, Ragmala, Naika, um, Yogika, etc. the whole discussion around that, which was uh, very interesting. And then, of course, um, my own paper. So um, I think there was three uh, kind of very important uh, differing inputs into the question of intermediality yesterday. So um, from that today, I mean, I was really impressed with the range of uh, papers that uh, were presented. The two on um, graphic novels, uh, then the first one on performance theater, um, then on the scroll paintings, um, and um, the two just now, which, as I said, I don't know if you could hear me, but the way they both spoke of time, uh, which is extremely moving. The first one about um, having had ample time and modernization kind of compressing and taking away that time. So culture gets affected. And the second one about consumption, impulsive consumption, and this uh, time of waiting that you're waiting, a refugee keeps waiting. So uh, all this, I think uh, many ideas ideas have been thrown forth. And as Professor Satyanath correctly pointed out, probably the emphasis on giving the, uh, you know, the details of the theory was a little too much. And what 
could have been, I mean, what could have made it better is analysis. I think finally what matters is in your paper is how you analyze with the theory behind you. So uh, it can't just be all theory because the theory is all usually somebody else's anyway that you are uh, recycling and representing uh, over here. So the thing, the interesting thing is when you're looking at the visual material. I think there were several things that has uh, that came about. One is the question of connected histories that of visuality of all the various media since yesterday. You know that the way in which media is connected with each other, the interfaces that is happening. Then also how mobile everything is. This you know what is called the mobility turn in. Um, uh, intermediality studies, cultural studies, basically, and in it's come into all the disciplines of the social sciences as well, uh, that you are looking at how things travel, how things are mobile, and how ideas go from one place to another. Uh, I think that uh, also the question of the hegemony of the verbal culture you know, kind of taking a back seat. That has also come up very strongly. The visual culture, as Professor Satyanath mentioned, uh, it's important also to have uh, had a bit of music. Uh, but I think what really came out very strongly and the positive thing of this workshop was the visual culture, uh, which, you know, whether it was in paintings, scrolls, whatever, so many kinds of visuality, graphic novels, uh, films, so many things. Um, and and uh, if, uh, verbal culture came, it's very interesting that it was pushed oh. beyond the human. Can you hear me? Um, it, it was pushed beyond the human, you know, in uh, one paper where uh, the presenter talked of the animals and the subalternity of animals and whether they could speak. So verbal culture, not just of humans, but beyond uh, the human world. Convergence, I think this was an important point that came up, how things have converged especially I think the gender aspect of, uh, which was brought out in the first paper in the morning, I think Neerthi's paper, the question of porous borders, how things are moving across borders. This is also part of the mobility thing. And, um, uh, you know, that uh, cultures really circulate. There is, I think the question of how there is no purity, some essential thing to, any kind of culture, whether it's visual or oral or whatever, uh, but that everything is a hybrid. I think this is a very important takeaway for me. The things are getting mixed, things are, and, and that's the greatness, that's the creativity, that's the uh, wonderful thing that is happening. Um, also what interested me was all the, you know, these drawings that came up, the diagrams that people had made uh, which, which are not just vertical, usually the diagrams are usually vertical and horizontal, but these were all circles, right from Satyanath in the morning to uh, the next paper on Dev and, you know, so this circularity uh, which came. And um, I think that, uh, you know, these papers really, if they could be put up somewhere or published or something, it, it, it's, it's, it's a workshop that really deserves to be um, known a little more. Um, I don't know if it's only this small circle or uh, how how this is, I mean, I'm not very tech savvy, but um, I think that these papers were extremely interesting. So this is just a few off the cuff points uh, on, on the workshop. So I think it was very productive. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um... I think we can carry this discussion forward with uh, Palaji sir and Amitabh sir. And also uh, others who may want to say something. In fact, I have a few questions which I didn't ask, but there was this paper, Anupriya, I think, who kept saying that uh, it's not like cinema 24 frames a second. She kept repeating this sentence, you know. Um, so, but, uh, but the thing is about graphic novels, comics, that uh, the lines are very, very um, sparse, right? The image is not as saturated as, as the image of photography or of cinema. So what happens is that when things are not saturated, you are also drawing 
on typage. Typage, which can also border on stereotypage. So you almost know the kind of expression that the character will have or, uh, you know, the way the person is going to look in the comic drawing or the graphic novel drawing, you know, there, there's, it's, 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 so it, it uh, actually lacks the depth of uh, what cinema or theater would give, like with the real people, you know, the diegetic world of, of actual characters and uh, how they look. So that was one question I had. I don't know if Anupriya is here. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, so no, Anupriya is not here. Yeah, she is not. <clears throat> uh, so um, I like to add a few points, and when the discussion happens, we can continue. And I'd really love if others, whoever wants to contribute, raises their hand, and so that Charu can notice that. Uh, you see, <clears throat> apart from what Satyanath has already said about participants, etc. I have noted a few things. First of all, I think uh, because we have felt an urge and also we have got enough material to argue for an Indian type of multimediality. Now to put it in context, there could be, uh, if we plan to publish a paper or something like that, there could be at least one talk or paper on how culture, even in West, is intermediate. Like just imagine pre, uh, pre-capitalist, post-capitalist as well. I'm bringing in pre-capitalist because I'm uh, talking about pre-medieval uh, medieval India, pre-modern India. Charge, the history of text in West. Uh, sculpture, these are also interlinked. Just look at the manuscript tradition of West. In the manuscript tradition, you find borders, you find uh, paintings. As we are saying that in India, the manuscript tradition is not monomedial, not just textual. The same goes for Western uh, codex, codexes, Western manuscripts, right? Uh, they won't call it manuscripts because uh, they are the, because concept, uh, the codex was already there. Now the point is even codex binding, codex covering, leathering. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is, I notice a sort of a danger uh, when we are finding that in ancient India or medieval India, expressions were multimedial. What I'm trying to say is that in West also, it was the same case. The types should be different. Theorization should be different. So for example, if I quote Bharat, Bharata to say, argue that Nataka is a multimedial form, then I have to talk about poetics as well where multiple mediums came together and that's, the, that's how Aristotle tries to understand and even argue that that is, that is a better uh, art form. This we need to be very serious about. Now, once we are aware of this, then comes two things. One, to distinguish between what has had already been conceptualized in medieval India or Indian knowledge tradition, and what our readings of material wants to theorize or conceptualize. Our postulation of theories based on the material we are handling and the theoretical framework already existing would interact, would be in dialogue, but only after we have identified them separately only after we are aware of this difference. Uh, I find, uh, I would such a, say that, I mean, there are a few texts or uh, primary material which are multimedial by nature. 
for example when nyuti talked about the ontological journey of the performer that the subject itself is going beyond what is given the same happens with graphic narratives it is already multimedia now in an intermediality workshop uh if we depend because we have the gift of graphic novel so if we just talk about how graphic novel uh graphic novel is intermedial i don't think that will add to this we need to put more material from various medial sites which will make it a multimedial investigation not in the intermediality that is already there in my primary anarding that if it is not been done already like in manuscript about manuscript traditions it was not so we anarded it but while it is already accepted as a such as such a text i think our presentation if methodologically does not bring in material from other media zones then perhaps we are not practicing that and this is where i come in the methodology it's important that one importance is which is thought of monomedial to show how that is intermedial this is a very important task as a lot of our participants have done second is while even dealing with that if possible uh and particularly when the material is itself more uh, non monomedial mono monomedial uh, if we can bring in material in our arguments material from other zones lastly we had a discussion in the morning about uh, what methodology we are taking uh, balaji me and satnath had a short conversation because most of us are students of literature i think the most important take away is the feeling this feeling that it's time we plan or think of how to write histories of literature knowing how literature performs our histories are not that we have we talk a lot about that because historiography has been an area on which satnath is has been working for such a long time and in dc also i have that we have this group uh but i think we need a generation of scholars who will because there you need a larger number of expertise areas larger number of people coming together uh in the history writing model that india uses from sahitya academy to down to the local academies is one person or two person writing history the only exception i have seen is uh, the bangla academy dhaka published a two volume history of bengali literature where they covered only two centuries and papers were from separate disciplines from music to art to anthropology and the chief editor tried to put all these things together to create an art uh he himself told me that it was not easy for him and he considered that he failed uh well i agree with him uh, but the point is that they tried it uh so perhaps in a follow up workshop or follow up discussions we can when at one end we will continue to be list to listen to such papers to lectures and on the other parallel we may meet as a group and as team to think how we can pursue this methodological change in the writing of literature uh these are my suggestions and observations thank you thank you amit doctor uh we do have a question in the chat which is by shilpa shri mishra and it's not directed to anyone specifically uh, i'll read out the question and maybe um, we can 
put this in the discussion deck it says japanese school paintings were one of their earlier earliest forms of literature what do you think of the interplay between words and images to tell a story that's the question uh, would anyone like to take this up it's a general question and yeah uh, i think uh, let people think but you know before that i think i will i want to put another not to connect the things that we have talked so far um, i think you know this is a very interesting uh, issue that that has cropped up uh, in front of uh, transmediality because of the points raised by rashmi and amitava rashmi actually brought uh, um, the tension that one of the speaker uh, proposed between uh, graphic uh, representation and the film um, and she said uh, the 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 qualitative difference is really uh, important in uh, understanding this i would like to just add a point and then take it to what uh, amitav uh, said you know i think the two are uh, it's possible to connect i think the density of information that the representational forum has has something to do with you know she she uh, and that creates actually uh, if the density of information is less in a representational form then there is a need for a redundancy principle to operate at the mental level of the person who is looking at the intermedial representation so i think you know this this is so this issue you know i'm not going to expand so the, what rashmi said is perfectly fine uh, it's not only uh, finer denser but also aesthetically pleasing compare a visual a, a, a graphic uh, uh, sketch with that of a finely light lit uh, you know uh, film strip or you know even a film frame which is where light has played a very important uh, role uh, so that 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 uh, that aesthetic dimension is also part and parcel of that uh, in which case for for using a graphic representation to compensate for that there should be high amount of redundancy present at the cognitive level of the uh, viewing system it could be a culture it could be individual and other thing i think this is what played a very important role in the type of medieval indian uh, uh, trans uh, intermediality uh, that we uh, amitabh suggested a, a need for a theory to be looked at it. i think medieval intermediality's uh, strength comes from its public sphere which was highly varied you know i understand a, a folk theater Uh, which is where everyone can participate including the untouchable uh, theoretically has to have multiple sensibilities present within the audience with our uh, uh, public sphere and the the performance has to tune itself to cater to the multiple needs so so the bigger the size of the um, public sphere probably the the intermediality forum has to work harder and harder and fine tune it to see that how all these things could be reached um i i think you know in order to, the last point that you raised the history 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 of uh, it's actually the history, we cannot write the history of transmediality uh, saying that you know it happened in this century this century we have to have a historiography a uh, history of literature of the sensibilities of the public sphere and how the interaction between the sensitivities of the public sphere and the art uh, or the or the expressive form were in were in a constant dialogue the changes that we talk of need to be understood in changes in these sensibilities in, in behind which there could be political reasons there could be uh, you know other reasons but i think all these histories have to be intervene in a very complex man probably that is uh, that that is one of the i mean if 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 the two points that raised by you and rashmi i personally feel that they are very important 
and eventually they need to be taken into the study of uh, Indian transmedia intermediality on the one hand and if we are mapping uh, the history of sensibility rather than that means history of transmediality culture then I think you know that uh, the historiography model should actually uh, pitch in uh, these uh, dimensions and should take into account some of these issues. I think you know, I'll stop here. Thank you sir. Um... We have uh, Durjiti Sharma with us, who would like to share. Yeah, and also yeah. ask Balaji to uh, uh, pitch in at some time after Durjiti is over. Absolutely, sir. Yeah. Uh, you please come back yeah. if you want to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charu. Am I audible, Charu? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, you are. You are. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, just wanted to add a few things vis-a-vis uh, -vis what Satyanath sir and subsequently what Amitabh sir has talked about. Uh, regarding Satyanath sir's, uh, like uh, the fact that uh, about the theory and uh, the fact that uh, not much uh, materials vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, representation has emerged. Now, I feel uh, literary studies, basically with what we are doing at present, is at a transitional phase because we are, uh, you know, belonging to literary studies, we are more adept in explaining things, interpreting things. But in terms of building an archive is something that not most of us are attuned to. Like we are not trained to actually. I don't know, Amitabh sir may like to disagree, but actually I feel that uh, we haven't yet been trained to build an archive and to sustain it. So uh, for a workshop like this, for presentations to come in, I think the first thing is to have a archive, a dense archive at our disposal. Something that uh, Rashmi Man's uh, presentation yesterday showed, where you could bring in, you know, these nuances. Nuance. Suppose, for example, there's a presentation on a scroll or a presentation on a, on say uh, some sculptures. And listen, until you have a variation, there are multiple variants. One cannot dis discriminate or explore the nuances. Right. So I feel the first step towards uh, kind of intermedializing literature will be to build a very strong archive. And this, I think, it's not easy to say. So it's very easy to say that we are building an archive, but this whole process should be integrated into the literature syllabus. The whole idea of how to approach, how to approach data, how to use it. So I think this is something that we could do into the future. I'm just trying to think aloud here. And the second thing uh, that I feel uh, we could uh, see and have uh, more uh, emphasis on is the whole idea of systematizing, uh, you know, multimediality within 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 Indian literature. So Tenet is already doing that, but uh, how do we define multiplicity? I mean, when we talk about multiple forms of expression, when we talk about multilinguality when we talk about, uh, you know, multimediality. So are we trying to actually be very categorically, categorical in our remarks? Because we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be dispersing, you know, that everything will come within the, within its ambit. We need to be saying, okay, what this, because see, when we talk about what gets excluded, again, this ex, what gets excluded from that is something is very important. Right. So whether we talk about text, whether we talk about orality, whether we talk about performance, we also need to see what gets excluded from that format. Because yesterday when Chetanasa was presenting, I had this kind of a niggling suspicion that are we not from performance, are we not again going back to script, you know, kind of scriptocentrism? Because even when something gets ritualized, ritualization is also a kind of a textualization. So are we not again going back to that you know, that primal point. So this circularity is something which we need to be very uh, careful about because that shouldn't, like, again, undo all the things that have been done in this regard. So this is some, these are some of the points that came into my mind, uh, you know, uh, but I know there are many other things to discuss and this is something that we all have started working on and I'm hopeful towards the future because within literary studies workshops such as this hasn't happened where we have actually gone beyond the text and we have tried to raise queries about so many things. And this is something we should encourage. And I'm really hopeful that things are going to be brighter and much more quote unquote critical uh, into the future. 
so this is what i had to say uh, thank you charu for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my views thank you thank you dhruv and yeah i mean these are quite uh, helpful uh, things which can be done and must be done we are i think we are going to move in that direction pretty soon so um, yeah. yeah so uh, i also would like to invite fatima uh, for her comments because she mentioned in the chat and then we can uh, have uh, professor balaji with us who is here with us we can have him uh, in the discussion yeah yeah but yeah. hi hi i just wanted to add on to what uh, amita sir added said about including western models of having this kind of hybridity uh, i would like to mention one example for example in canada the metis community is a mix of french and the indigenous population so uh, since most of them live on the border area so the american government wants to american state wants to call them as americans and canadians wants to canadian state wants to label them as canadians what about their own subjectivity or what they think about their oral tradition their culture their stories i mean whether they are comfortable being called as hybrid or indigenous or canadian so there are problems uh, of representation of hybridity um even in the west and just like in india it's not one single monomaniac culture uh, which can be defined in single one directional paradigms yeah so just wanted to uh, add the example of the metis community which is which i find is quite problematic in in the western context in america thank you in fact there is fatima there's this whole new discipline of border studies and border studies with borderlands and you know with all the concomitant uh, concepts that comes in to study precisely uh, people such as these you know who live on borders and uh, how they cope with uh, dual triple identities and how it's part of their lives and part of their life worlds and how they um, you know how they think of i mean their own agency vis-a-vis -vis the border not just what the states uh, impose on them but what they themselves feel about living on the border mm -hmm. um, yeah and especially i mean if the identities are imposed on them then who is going to speak on the, on their behalf and Uh, how do we label stories coming out of them that also becomes problematic in fact i can just add that uh, you know in europe there are so many of these um, serials that are coming uh, which deal with the border in a sense with two countries you know this side that side the people and usually it's a crime or a thriller or a who done it and how they are constantly crossing borders then they they're very interesting some of them uh, which are dealing with i mean not of indigenous peoples and the peoples living there but just this business of crossing borders the border has become a very important um motif metaphor or... and trope and i mean it's a real reality but it's also political reality and but it's also so many more things today um in fact i if i could just add a little you know uh, to what everybody has said till now i think also what is important uh, for a workshop such as this is um going into detail and uh, so the big thing is good you know um uh, the big macro picture for everything is very good but also with the macro picture the micro picture is needed that you go into detail and this is from bakhtin you know right from bakhtin because that's where dialogicity begins then intertextuality and then intermediality that uh, is being talked about so what is this detail the detail is that moment of dialogicity which is not purely verbal you know of course jacobson talks of the non verbal but this is this is not just non verbal this was the difference between the formalists and bakhtin this is the non verbal or whatever else in a communication which carries the dialogue within it what is dialogue it is the 
perception and the cognition of the other, the position of the other. It's an ideological position, you know? So um, if, for instance, uh, you say that, um, oh, oh, great, you know, we are living in great times. And I say, hmm. So that, hmm, is, it's, it's, it's a whole discourse. It's a whole paragraph, actually. It's telling you what I think of the times we are living in what I personally think about it, right? So that that is that, and in, in fact, this point was raised by uh, the person who spoke on the namas, the Hamza nama and things, you know, that how the moment of translation, the moment of dialogue is the grain of voice, it's the intonation, it's, you know, if, if, if you say, um, uh, I, I like this film, and I say, oh, I like this film. So, you know, again, there I have repeated the words, the words are the same, but you know that I actually haven't liked it. And whereas the other person has actually liked it. So the, the intonation, so that is the detail, you know, that when you start analyzing, you have to get into details. Um, and this, this, and detail as what? As dialogicity, as that moment where the other's position manifests itself in you. It has come into you, you know, that he, he, I've used your words, but I've infused my intonation into it. Uh, th that, and that happens all the time in intermediality. I mean, it's in when texts are coming together and that's where your critical contribution lies, you know, apart from the larger theory that we all partake of, but, this is where, when you're looking at a work or, or a text, you need to really get into the detail. So I think this is important. And some, some of the th uh, papers really went into it, it uh, in the morning. In fact, I, I really liked the uh, Jen's thing on, on, I mean, she, she spent all the time on theory, but in the end, when she spoke, I think it was a Kashmiri graphic novel. That picture she showed was very nice. I, I mean, I wasn't even aware of there was such a thing. So in fact, I'll look it up. So that, that thing could have been really analyzed. You could just go into that one photo, you could have gone into it deeper, you know, if she's here, um, rather than tell us the whole thing of focalization and da 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 and all that, you know, so that that's how to structure. This is about structuration also. Yeah, if I may, uh, you know, uh, I found uh, what Fatima said, you know, uh, the idea of representation very uh, poignant and important for my own research work because it's it's in an area where, uh, you know, I am an outsider too. And I've had, uh, you know, uh, problems when I, when I go, when I enter that space and uh, try to look at them, uh, you know, in this uh, way and uh, ask my question as to how am I representing them and uh, you know what uh, the problems are with that. So you know I'm going to give this a little bit more of a thought. You know, this is just a personal thing that I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, uh, <clears throat> I was going to say that uh, when Fatima talked about that community, what came to my mind is not similar but comparable experience of experience of the Quebec living a French community and a French. They consider themselves Quebec now and how, how they have managed this and they themselves did it. It's not the state. I mean, I understand that's a different thing that the state imposes. Uh, the Quebec experience is also very interesting in that way. Thank you so much uh, to everyone uh, for these, this exciting discussion. And uh, I would now really like to request Balaji sir for his comments. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yes, I think uh, a lot has already been said. But, but let me get down to it. Uh, the idea is most of us who are participating in this intermediality questions are thinking in too literary a manner. Yeah. Now, our conventional ideas of what literature is or your conventional genealogies of literature, uh, the formation of genres, you know, genre studies, 
and so on and so forth might not help as much within this intermediate questions right i mean it might give you a frame but it might not help so much uh the the, the reason the reason could be let's say if i if i can use a very literary statement the poetics of let's say writing a version of the ramayana and carving the ramayana on stone they're going to be extremely different extremely different in the sense they, they, in terms of in terms of its uh, disciplinarity it's going to be different all right i mean you have something called the shilp shastras right and uh, the the stone masons would be working on a particular discipline yeah so it's 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 extremely crucial that we get out of literary frames when we are trying to understand interdisciplinarity now how are we going to go about this that, that's that's why i was stressing on the idea of disciplines because i found that i found this problem i had encountered this problem and and trying to find a unified theory of intermediality is going to be very very difficult i mean it's 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 a state of the impossibility it's like having it's like finding a uniform theory of physics absolutely impossible mainly because uh, the cultural conditions that inform transmission are going to be different at different stages in time and they're going to be different in, at at different layers you know uh, it's going to be different at different uh, periods as well as uh, in terms of in terms of time studies so if you're going to search for uh, like that, that that's the literary way of looking at it in the sense we are looking at it in terms of a unified theory yeah like in, in the sense we have uh a one all fit all of trying to understand how this is going to function but that might not help as much mainly because as i said conditions are going to be very very different in the sense the conditions of intermediality uh in pre modern era yeah? let's say uh in the proto history period would be very very different uh from the kind of intermediality that you visualize in the uh, in the, uh, by the time writing came you know by the time paleography came uh am i making sense guys so far <coughs> yes you are so very provocative yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are inviting others to to jump into the <laughs> yeah so the large so the idea is idea is not to have this uh, option put it a very literary idea it cannot be a literary idea all right we need to get out of our literary poetics if we want to understand this now one way out one way out is to have a disciplinary idea all right uh, one way could be uh, let's say the group uh, starts involving people from other disciplines you know uh, say people from anthropology people from uh let's say border studies or film studies or something some, some, something like that all right or uh, from the discipline of history where where you have a certain methodological focus into why it's happening or how it's happening once you have that then it's possible to have a have a, a literary take on it because the problem is as i said a one all fit all theory is going to be very difficult here. so yeah uh, yes professor satyanath provocative uh it provocative in the sense i think you know <laughs> you have you have done a very wonderful generalization ha huh? uh, which actually invites uh, some sort of an inquiry that uh, the, the structural representation of ramayana follows a different canon whereas the uh, the textual representation of the the ramayana follows a different canon which is very interesting and uh, but uh, there are products for example theater is a product of uh, both these coming together or uh, you know to one another thing ragmala painting is also another form it is already there where actually um, musical canon uh, literary canon because most of the in the ragamala paintings uh, the sragadhyanas are from uh, either uh, from mesakarna or uh, from someone you know who who actually composed them as uh, poetry to be sung at uh, at the time of looking at the ragamala painting or something if if it is not that so now you know what 
in the absence of uh, approaching them from the canonical pathway for example iconography iconography has remained separately iconography also deals with uh, textual iconography versus non textual iconography uh, it's a set of conventions uh, so if if such a thing has happened somewhere in our own 13th 14th century then you know the probably the the link with the canons uh, sh- that means shastras either the shilpa shastra sangita shastra and the kavya shastra somewhere the 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 the, the representation the the ragmala itself probably provide clues uh, for us to be um, exploring what is the nature of relationship here and, and also i think you know with all the three things put in one it has a different uh, uh, you know aesthetics and a different set of conventions to understand that than what we have uh, in the previous period for example uh, the 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 text the textures that uh, increase when the painting come into existence from the earlier sculptural um, period this is uh, it's already there in ajanta that's the earliest example that we have uh, but we also have earlier ones but somehow there is a paradigm shift around this time and probably that uh, you know it's all these things the the issue that you raise this provocative because you have thrown a ch- challenge on us to think as to how how do we negotiate that uh, one of the thing is to say that uh, iconography and uh, Uh, that means uh, shilpa shastra and the kavya shastra did not uh, meet and interact at all the other one is to see how how uh, an interaction uh, could have taken place within these conventions now that we have a form sitting in front of us with all this this, this again this again goes back to um, theater you know for example when the 19th century new modern theater emerges you know it is actually absorbing from a variety of sources it has metrical structures from uh, elite folk and uh, popular it has uh, me- metrical structures from ancient medieval and modern it has musical format from so i think you know the 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 a closer study and a deconstruction of the form itself should provide us clues to negotiate this yes sir i do agree but uh but you also agree that there is a a gradation there's a complete uh, difference in terms of how mediality functions across time doesn't it yep yes sure yes. yep yeah so that's where that's where i find this uh, a uniform idea slightly problematic i mean it might not address it's not problematic it might not address everything Right. I I'm not talking of a new reform idea I'm talking yeah. of a um, either you, you take it uh, as a multiple these are multiple centers yes um, uh, or you know the, the the places of paradigm shift uh, yes uh, uh, it is here that we need to concentrate that was the uh, suggestion that I agree. that you, I agree that your I agree. idea is very challenging and you know actually we should take you uh, take your uh, words you know very very uh, seriously and think in that direction <laughs> In fact, in fact, uh, if we could just open DC in a major way to other disciplines, students of other disciplines, and and uh, people from other disciplines, automatically the problems will get solved out because uh, you're going to have, uh, as I said, certain answers because these are disciplinary questions that are coming in. The moment you talk about culture, you're talking about anthropology. These are disciplinary questions. the idea is to i mean not to think about it too much in terms of literary terms i mean that's that that's our discipline yes but our discipline might not be a complete answer to what's happening around us i agree with you sir yeah, no i think you know you have opened it up let me just leak the news you know once balaji me and shubha we planned a sort of a, a, a a panel or something like that in where biology would speak from the point of view of archaeology i will talk from the point of view of transmediality and shubha will uh, talk from the point of view of comparativity so we unfortunately the panel did not take place but i think you know it's it's a it's a wonderful uh, we were able to do a little of that here 
Uh, I only wish Shubha would have been here. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> to um, after this discussion between Satyanath and Balaji, um, yeah, um, maybe our papers didn't really ask us to, I mean, try to find out one model. Each of them were working with different primary material and also different models of approach. Now, given that our disciplinary orientations are there, until we is, uh, Jepetnek suggested that we have multidisciplinary research teams, which is almost impossible in India, but maybe in the online era, we might find a way out. So how would I do that as a student of literature? I think that model has to be centripetal and centrifugal. Whatever primary material I want to put at center remains the center. But I go out, I go around and wherever I find enough material and then start detailing as uh, so nicely has been put by Professor Durai Sami. Uh, these exercises, after doing 10 to 15 years, maybe uh, will give shape to a certain methodology or understanding that won't be the the unified theory of everything. But I think that would be a intermedial phase in literary studies. Oh, I, I, like, I like that last comment, Amrita. Wonderful. <laughs> Ma'am, uh, you'd have to unmute. Sorry. Intermedial stage of intermediality. <laughs> what you said in the last line. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <clears throat> so... Uh, Thank you so much for these discussions. Uh, I, I don't want to end this, but uh, I would really like to request if some of us can have our cameras on and we can take a quick picture, if that's okay with everyone. We... I think we must also thank Nilza, who's been... Uh, <laughs> I know that she had a problem chasing me, at least. <laughs> for the title and abstract so i'm sure she did it with everybody and so i think it's a lot of work put in and then you prepare your own paper so it's it's good it's good work done a workshop is work basically the word word workshop points to the work and the shop <laughs> it's it's really and very will, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think the charu and uh, abhishek uh, helped her you know that was the team which did all these things okay. although um, sometimes the credit goes to the coordinator yes um, so they, they have done it and charu also i think great work yeah. done as an i'm an outsider and observing so i think it's all been uh, really very very productive that's me for all practical purpose you're a dc we don't, you're a dc person we don't yes. think that you're an outsider <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and they really work hard for each and every project. Each of the team works very hard. In fact, Zera and Fatima, I wanted to also tell you that there is this, I have, I have been looking through my papers to see if I could find the name, but I can't find the name. There's this very wonderful uh, West Asian artist uh, who has, you know, with because of all these refugees and their histories, she's uh, made these installations where there's a map and uh, you know the pen goes from one place to the other where the refugees go so it's it's you know again detailing that thing that you go in and you show exactly where the refugee stops and then well I, I just can't remember her name but she's very well known and uh, it, it's it's very amazing work she's done so maybe you could i don't know google and find it i've been trying to find it i was looking up my notes i couldn't find her name somewhere written it down so there's a very interesting uh, work being artwork being done on 
uh, the refugee problem. Okay, uh, Anam, ready? We are. We have almost all the cameras on. Thank you so much. Click <laughs> by Abhishek only. So uh, I, I'm I'm actually ready. So we should ask Abhishek if whether he's ready or not. Hey, Abhishek, good to go. Hi, Joy. Where is Abhishek? I can't see that name here. Abhishek was. Yeah, I think he has some internet connection uh, issue, but he will. Uh, so, uh, Anam, uh, you can take. Uh, actually, so I'm joining uh, with my oh. mobile phone, so it is not possible for me to. I, I'm, I'm taking it. I'm uh, taking it. Okay, okay. Okay, let's. I also take it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Alka. Yeah, it's done. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry once again for this mess up in this last. No, no, it, I didn't even know what happened to my computer. I've never had a problem. We were able to see char yars, uh, you know, yeah. out of which one of the yars is your yar. <laughs> I was about to warn Abhishek that we could be getting for, uh, Zoom bombed when I saw char yar, and then. I mean, before I could even send that warning to him, I saw ma'am on the screen. Like, okay, Chariyar yes. uh, yeah. is the group. Chariyar is the group that uh, Madan, uh, you know, uh, has. Yeah. Is, uh, part of which, uh, part of that. So Chariyar, I, I quickly sent him out of the room. I said, just <laughs> leave your computer and buzz off. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. I'm really sorry about that. It was. No, Nilda for for the vote of thanks. So finally, the two days are done. Um, I am, you know, sighing a huge sigh of relief, <laughs> and um, I'll just begin thanking uh, everyone so that we can all uh, resume. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to first of all thank our three keynote speakers of the first day, Professor Satinath. Dr. Nadia Katoni and Professor Rashmi Doreswami for accepting our invitation and for presenting their ideas in our workshop. I thank Professor Balaji Ranganathan, Professor Nishad Zaidi, and Professor Rashmi Doreswami again for agreeing to chair the different sessions and to all the speakers who presented their papers and enriched this workshop with their participation. Our convener, Professor Amitav Chakravarti, and then Professor Satinath and Professor Subhadas Gupta for guiding us throughout this process. Thank you for your constant support. I thank Srimoya Chattopadhyay. I'm so sorry, Srimoya. It's very hard <laughs> for me to pronounce it. Please forgive me. Uh, Pavitra Kumari, Priya Lekha, and Charulika Dhawan for moderating their respective sessions. Uh, Durjati Sarma for introducing Delhi Comparatives, and Anam Siddiqui for making our posters and uh, certificates. Thank you to Delhi Comparatist uh, members and everyone who joined us on both days. And finally, to the best organizing team that I have had the privilege of being a part of, Charulika Dhawan and Abhishek Vargis. Thank you a million times because this was not, it would not have been, been possible without you all. Thank you and I wish you all a good evening ahead. Thank you so much. Okay.